Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so, my name is Anusha. I'm a software engineer at Ava Labs. And today we're going to be talking about customizing the EVM with stateful precompiles. Okay. Oops. Okay. So let's kind of talk about what we're going to be going through. Uh, first, we will have like the intro, uh, just like basic context you need to know to understand what stateful precompiles are. Uh, we'll be talking about VMs and then the subnet EVM and then precompiles. And then we'll be talking about stateful precompiles. Uh, we'll take a look at the state DB, and then I'll go over like five of five stateful precompile examples that we have in subnet EVM. OK, so just some uh, information about the VM. Blockchains are nothing but distributed state machines, right? Um, and so the VM defines specific rules for the blockchain. It defines the state transitions. It defines the state. Uh, it defines how the transaction should look. Uh, it defines the API, right? Um, and so every blockchain on Avalanche is an instance of a VM. So in the case of the C chain, um, it is uh, an instance of the EVM, OK? Um, and the C chain uses a modified fork of Geth. Okay. So let's talk about subnets. A subnet is a sovereign network that defines its own rules regarding its membership and um, its token economics. The technical definition of a subnet it is it is a subset of the validator set. Okay. Um, and so uh, what a subnet can also have many blockchains. Uh, we can think of the primary network, which is the X chain, C chain, P chain, as also the primary subnet, right? Uh, and so what's kind of what's cool about subnets? You can, you can do whatever you want with them. You can uh, have them uh, have like KYC so they follow like compliance laws, right? Uh, you can do your own to tokenomics for it. Um, you can make it private. Um, you can do, you can make it your own custom blockchain. Um, and so the subnet EVM is an even more simplified version of the EVM uh, and also supports smart contracts. Cool. Okay. So that is a little bit of the basics. So now we're going to be talking about precompiles. What are precompiles? Uh, precompiles are shortcuts within the EVM that uh, execute the function in the native language uh, of the EVM rather than a smart contract. So here's how it works, right? Normally, you deploy a contract, right? And now they're, they're, the address the contract address is now associated with compiled, the compiled smart contract, the bytecode, right? So now when you call a smart contract function, um, uh, in, in the EVM, we, the EVM interpreter finds the correct bytecode and executes it. And that's how normal smart contracts work, okay? But precompiles work a slightly different way, okay? When a precompile function is called, we actually, in the EVM, redirect it to the function that was implemented, in this case, Golang, and we just execute the function right then and there in the EVM, okay? Um, so why is this better? Precompiles are uh, super uh, cost efficient, and they are you know, faster. Some, uh, some of the functions are faster. So right now in Go Ethereum, uh, there are like nine precompiles. All of them are cryptographic primitives. Um, some, of, some of the examples are listed. Um, and they're bundled in the EVM at fixed addresses and called with determined gas costs. OK. All right. So that's in Ethereum. OK, this is how the precompiled interface looks like. Um, 
given an input, uh, we return some number that is the required gas for that uh, precompile. And then obviously we also have the run function, takes in some input and returns some bytes. Cool. So we'll also look at an example. All right, the SHA-256 precompile, very, very uh, simple. Uh, based on the input size, we return um, some cost. And then we, based on the input, we use a SHA-256 library in Go and return the answer. So this is way faster and cheaper just to do in Golang rather than in the EVM. So that's, that's the benefit of a precompile. And all we do is we redirect it to run this whenever someone runs SHA-256. OK. So now let's talk about stateful precompiles. So these are available in the subnet EVM. And uh, they build on a precompile in that they add state access. So what does that mean? You can modify EVM state. Um, this allows you to add more functionality and customization to the subnet EVM. What can you do? You can um, modify balances. You can modify nonces. You can uh, modify account storage. Um, you can create addresses. So this unlocks a lot more like potential for customization of your own blockchain. So let's go over the stateful precompile interface, right? Now we have, um, you can see here, we only have one function. It's the run function. Takes in a lot of inputs. But the most important one is accessible state. We now take in state as an input, and uh, that allows us to modify uh, the EVM state. So let's look at. OK, we don't have an example. But we can look at the state DB interface. Uh, so this is the interface for accessing EVM state. Uh, again, uh, can modify nonces, balances, actual state itself. Um, and so how this, work, how this works is like, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it, we, in um, the EVM, we have. Um, the state tri which manages all the state of all the accounts ever. And so when you call get balance or uh, when you modify balances or nonces, you're simply just modifying um, the state associated with a certain account. And if you modify actual state, you also modify the account storage tri as well. And that's it. So based on these reads and writes, this is how you can determine uh, the cost of your stateful precompile -comp pre based on how many reads or writes you do. OK. OK, so now I'm going to be talking about five examples of stateful precompiles that we have like out of the box in subnet EVM. Um, OK, so the first one is like the allow list. So we have the TX allow list, transaction allow list, and the deployer allow list. So how this works is that accounts or addresses can have roles associated with them, right? Admin role, enabled role, no role. Admin role allows you to modify the allow list and the precompile. Enabled role only uh, lets you call the precompile. Um, and then you have no role, which is the default. And so based on what you set the state at for these particular like, accounts, uh, you now can, your, certain people are, can, can now be allowed to deploy contracts. Or they can be allowed to send transactions based on what role you gave them. So this is really helpful if you're running a subnet and you kind of want someone to be the admin of that subnet, right? Uh, you don't want anyone just doing anything. Uh, so these uh, stateful precompiles allow for um, like permission or role setting. And you can, you can take this and you can do, you know, these are just examples that we, we have already, but you can, if you are building a, um, a subnet, you can do so much more with this or certain uh, permission kind of, kind of things. Okay. 
Uh, we also have the fee manager. Okay, so usually what happens is you set all your fee config stuff in Genesis. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, if you, needed, if you need to modify your fee config stuff, like your min base fee or your block, or your, uh, block gas costs, you would need to do an upgrade, which is annoying. Well, what if you could set the state of the fee or the fee config like associated with an address, or you can you can now modify um, the fee config through a precompile without needing an upgrade, right? So it's like just think about like if, as long as you can store state somewhere, you can you can do cool things like this. Okay, native minter. Uh, you can now add a balance to a specified address uh, of your choice, uh, of, of the native token of that subnet, of course. Uh, this is useful for, um, I don't know, managing your tokenomics. Uh, we, we, use it, um, we use it for, um, like, bridging purposes. If, someone wants to move money from the C chain to a subnet, they can burn on the C chain and then mint um, uh, on, on our subnet. So that's one, one use case, right? Um, we have the reward manager. Uh, again, we choose, you can choose what happens to the Coinbase reward. Uh, three choices. These can be zero, one, two, right? Burn reward. Send reward to a predefined address, uh, or enable the reward to be collected by certain block producers. Right? Again, we just set the state of the precompile address to one of these choices, and now the EVM knows what to do. Okay. So now I would love to talk about the dangers of stateful precompiles. Right? Um, the possibilities are endless, but they're not that endless, right? Uh, what, so what are some dangers of stateful precompiles? Maybe I should ask the audience and then uh, put some, I can say the answer. What, 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 does, what, what do people think can go wrong with stateful precompiles? And if you uh, raise your hand, you'll get a mic. Okay. <laughs> So, um, if you mess with the state and something goes wrong, probably you can't roll back, can you? Like yes, well, yes, modifying state is always a risky business. Uh, you don't want to modify uh, any account state that, that's not your own, right? Uh, or in risk uh, modifying balances or nonces or state, uh, storage state that's not your own. That's great. That's a, that's one of them. Yeah. Yes. So I guess one danger would be that you can modify some contract state and get into something inconsistent sure. because you're passing the required checks in the contract. Sure, sure. Um, yes, again, modifying other people's uh, state, right? Um, exactly, sure. That could be a danger, yep. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so one, another danger is, uh, let's say you have a stateful precompile that's very, uh, you know, intense. It does a lot of reads and writes, for example, and you set the uh, cost of that stateful precompile to be extremely low. What happens now? That means you opened up like a DOS vector. Someone can endlessly call a precompile function and, uh, for cheap, right? And have it be really intense on, on the EVM, right? So that opens up a DOS vector. Uh, what else? Uh, f another thing is if your uh, stateful precompile function is uh, non-deterministic, meaning given the same input, you get two different outputs. Now you now, like you have inconsistent state. Two nodes running the same function with the same input cannot agree, right? So don't put like a random number generator in a stateful precompile. 
okay? And so now this is, so now I just warned you about the dangers. Um, but looking past that, we can do cool things in the realm of cryptography, obviously. We can do cool things in the realm of privacy, right? Uh, anything that's specific to your subnet. So that is my last slide. And I actually want to open it up to questions uh, from people. Any, any questions? Or is anyone excited about or thinking about building uh, a stateful pre -compile? Yes. So the last thing you said about, you know, modifying also some cryptographic functionality. Sure. Do you have a case, I'm just brainstorming, but do you have a case where you change the, the signature scheme for the EVM so that not using ECDSA but using something else? Um, well, I, I, I don't think we can do that. Remember, these are just functions, like isolated functions. We can't modify like the whole EVM yeah. uh, like that. Yeah. Okay, you need more than that now. Yeah. So when you talk about cryptography, would you uh, like especially look into the realms of like uh, ZK cryptography? So would it make would it open up doors like to I don't know build a ZK EVM or something? Sure, you, you could you could do that. Uh, yeah, you could do that. I'm I'm not exactly sure. Like, I, I'm not too knowledgeable about ZK, but you you could you could do that. Uh, so one of the examples you mentioned when uh, changing the state yeah. is the config file. Fee, which is the, fee the initial manager? config file, yeah. Sure. So uh, that's something which has been bootstrapped when the subnet is up, like when we create the subnet, right? Uh, is it possible to modify, like introduce a new state, like uh, an additional information inside the config file at the later state? Like, uh, for example, if you had... 10 Say, fields. Yeah, in config in file, you just mentioned like uh, my com uh, like uh, my consensus yeah. is like proof of work and, or stake. Sure. And I say like this is my native token and all those things. Sure, sure. So is it possible to introduce additional field rather yeah. than the fields I mentioned in the yes. consensus already? Yes. So it essentially upgrades the well, entire file? Yes. Or? Um, okay, so, uh, okay, let me, let me, before I say yes, uh, when you build your pre-compile, um, you, uh, for the fee, the fee manager one, it's essentially a mapping between 10 fields, so like block, gas cost, min base fee, blah, 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 blah. And then it, um, those are set in the pre-compile. So then whatever those 10 fields are, are the only 10 things you can modify. After that pre-compile is, is deployed. You can't just now then add whatever you want, like whatever, extra fields you want. It's whatever, so whenever, it's whatever the 10 fields you put in the pre-compile to start with. So uh, essentially the pre-compile, like when we define like two or three uh, set of data, so that can be modified at, in the near, like in the future, but not any, anything else. Yes, other yes, than that. exactly. Uh, so the other question was like, uh, when, when I create a config file, right? Like I say sure. like, uh, information A, B, C, sure. so there are three states created for that. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to introduce a new state or is it only mod, the pre can only modify the existing state? Uh, again, um, it's when you write your pre-compile, you set the three states, and then the function can just change the, uh, the state associated with the address, but okay. you would need to, if you wanted to modify your pre-compile to have more state, that would be an upgrade. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so how would that look in practice? So the um, fee manager, <coughs> you can change the, the config. So how does that like look on like what's getting triggered on the chain? How sure. does it actually go uh, to change the fees at the end of the day? Sure, sure. So it works kind of the same way, like a smart contract function gets called, right? Um, you, you would deploy a contract. Uh, in that contract, um, we have the interface of the pre-compile, and then we would implement the interface. Uh, and those functions that get called, 
uh, in the, I don't know if you know call in the EVM, the call uh, function. All, it, all we do is we say, hey, is this address a precompiled address? The, and if, if so, we redirect it to um, the function we implemented in Go, right? Uh, if this is Go Ethereum, or, uh, and, and then we just call it. Um, so does that mean I can actually, because if I do it in a smart contract, I could give this power to like a DAO or something, or a community. Yes. So I could actually give, Anyone unlike, uh, unlike in a, on Ethereum or something, I could give a DAO much more power to actually decide on state within the yes. DVM. I couldn't give it on Ethereum or something. Yes, Ethereum doesn't do this. Um, they have a fixed EVM that they bar rarely make changes to. Well, I mean, I'm in terms of pre-compiles. Uh, and then, um, and uh, yes, but yes, anyone can call those functions. Yes, a DAO could, could have more um, responsibility or, or more power to change state within the EVM. Yes. Any more questions? Okay, cool. Well, thank you.